What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Free Range American. Today, I'm joined by a longtime friend of mine we like to call Peaches. <laughs> Hi, Peaches. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. You know, I've been looking forward to this one because uh, you're involved in in an uh, organization that you and a bunch of your friends have created that I really think is something that is super necessary for our community and super, you know, it's, it's been a long time coming. It, a lot of us have been fulfilling those roles just, uh, for the last decade and a half, just, you know, once people either get our information or whatever, you know, I've been receiving phone calls for, for years from air force people interested in joining, uh, the TACP career field. But for those of you out here that don't know who peaches is, peaches is a combat controller. Uh, he has a podcast called One's Ready, and One's Ready focuses on the uh, advice and preparation for people that are interested in an Air Force Special Warfare career. So go ahead and tell us about that, Peaches. Well, it's something that we started up this past November. Um, we've got myself as a combat controller. I've got a special reconnaissance guy. I've got, or who's named uh, Trent. And then I've got a PJ named Aaron, and then I've got another PJ who is training to be or going to school to be a PA named Brian. So between the four of us and then we've got Brian's wife, Nikki, in the background making sure that everything works because there's no way that we could actually make this thing come together and do all the editing and paperwork and stuff like that. So she takes care of all that kind of stuff. So have you found your guys attack P yet? I know you've been searching. We have been searching. Um, We've gone through two already. And that is that is not for lack of um, of trying on our part, and not really lack of commitment it's just on people their getting jobs. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. It's just life happens, and then you know, and most of us, except for Brian, are kind of coming towards the end of our career. So we're um, maybe less busy or more busy, but maybe we just know how to man- <laughs> manage our time a little bit better. <laughs> Both, yeah. So. You guys, how long have you been doing the podcast? When did the podcast first start? Uh, we dropped it Thanksgiving weekend of 2019. So oh, we, so you, yeah, yeah. So it's it's new. Um, I'm not sure how many episodes. I think we've got 25 ish episodes. We we usually drop one a week every Saturday. But in all reality, though, I mean, there's just such a lack of information on these four career fields out there. I mean, for a while. The only thing that existed for them was on Socknet. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, so and, you would- and it was a it was a great source, and that's that's kind of where we came up with this because we were just like on social media with everybody else, like yourself. You know, you, you try and educate when you're asked questions or you see somebody that has a question, you answer the best you can, right? But the problem is there we were getting approached by people because the amount of information that is out there on the net now is is insane and a lot of it is out of date and so we're able to as as active duty team guys able to you know give that kind of information give advice what we went through you know our successes our failures what we experienced so it's good and and it's been well received better than i thought (laughs) well i i would have to say and, and you can tell me what your thoughts are on this is it's like um you know, obviously culture has shifted and people's behaviors are a lot different now than when you and I came in, because it's like when you and I came in, I, I didn't ask anybody, any, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I didn't even know I was going to go TACP until I went to basic training. And even then, like once I, once I got a slot to the schoolhouse and I got to the schoolhouse, I didn't know anybody to ask anything, but the instructors. So and it's there's like, no way you're going to open your mouth and ask something like that. Exactly. You're just, you're just <laughs> what, gonna, are, what are we here for? <laughs> you're dodging, you know, those, those men as much as you possibly can, because you don't want them to know your name that yep. well. Uh, <laughs> but obviously that didn't work out well for me. Of course, you know, I was loud and young and stupid, but <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a big common, like the common question now with all these young kids that I get all the time is, you know, what advice do you have for me to pass the schoolhouse? And and it's hard for me to come up with that answer because it's like there's no answer I can give you. This is this is your gig. Like and you have to keep it your gig. And that's kind of what I've been telling him is it's like you know 
while you're there, don't forget why you wanted to be there. Yep. And it's like, you, you, you know that it's going to be hard and you know it's going to be a test. And it's like, at the end of the day, what, what are they going to do? Make you run more? Make you do more exactly. push-ups? And so you're going like, to you're gonna have to do that anyway. And everybody's why or everybody's you know motivation and drive to make it through is different. I mean, one of the guys that left out of here in Tampa, he was he was homeless. He was a wow. homeless. Yeah, dude, this dude's story. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Is is incredible. He's a young kid in and out of foster homes his entire you know kid life or childhood, and was like, you know, I I'm homeless. I want to get out of this. Went and saw a special operations recruiter, which if you're not familiar with, are the regionally based. Recruiters yeah. that are specially trained for special. I talk to a lot of them on Instagram. Yeah, they're uh, fantastic. Instagram. Yeah, and they're specially really like trained. Them. And and normal recruiters, normal Air Force recruiters, can help you as well. But these special operations recruiters are trained a little bit differently. But yeah, this kid's like, hey, I'm I'm tired of being homeless. I want to do something with my life, and he's at selection right now. <laughs> and I, so I still hear from him. It's dude. It's so inspiring uh, talking to him. It's great. It's got to be wild. Like that's a transition right there. You're going from like he's got to be in heaven. Wait, all I, I got to do is all I got to do is push ups and swim and get yelled at. All right, that's not that I, bad. I got a bed. I got exactly. a bed and <laughs> and meals. I get to eat. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And and I'll tell you what the 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 kind of perspective and life experience that he rolls into the pipeline with is. I mean, how how can you match that? No, not at all. Well, we'll we'll jump back into the the ones ready thing uh, towards the end here, and 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 talk more about what you guys are doing when it comes to the development of of these young guys. But you know, let's dive in. You know, something uh, a lot of you might not know is Peaches was a plank owner of of a very big deal in the Air Force. Uh, I mean, it's a huge deal. You know, uh, you guys were the ones that went to Nellis and you created Fighter Weapons School for JTAX and, uh, you know, got it approved that you can have a Fighter Weapons School patch, which is a massive ordeal. Yeah, huge. And a lot of people were in your way and a lot of people didn't like it. And a lot of, and when I say a lot of people, a lot of Air Force officers, pilots, <laughs> We're very angry that you dirty little operators went out there and you made your own weapon school. But, uh, you know, tell us about that. What was that experience like? It was, it was pretty awesome. So I, I went out there in 2011 and a lot of the foundation and groundwork was, was laid already the plan. And, and they had known that they wanted to get quite a few guys out there. So you had, you know, um, pimp who was out there, you know, several years before we got out there doing a different mission set, but that was the end goal. And he was embedded with the A-10s, like within their squadron. So like uh, an old school Baylow trainer. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So he was doing that. And then the whole idea of like, hey, this weapon school thing, this is a great gig. And combat control and TACP need this for the JTAC mission set, which makes perfect sense. And who else are you going to put it under? than, you know, the A-10s, the CAS experts. Yeah. So, um, a lot and CAS, of- what, what, what he's talking about there, close air support. Uh, my last, my last podcast I did with Grand Thumb, a lot of people complained like, Hey, half the things you guys were talking about, we don't know what, <laughs> what that was. Cause him and I, him and I just like started going off like yeah. you and I probably will do on this. We'll go off <laughs> in our own world. And then everyone's like, what the fuck are they talking about? So all of this is a, is an ad- advanced course that is now out in Nellis that used to not exist, but it's like, it is the top gun for ground controllers. Yep. Exactly. So for the guys, the combat controllers and, and, and the tack piece that are the dudes calling in airstrikes and planning and coordinating, you know, multi-stack missions and things like that. This is their top gun. Yep. And, uh, it's super, super awesome, super important. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's where, it's where we take guys and girls who are already instructors and then make them better instructors and give, you know, essentially make, it's a PhD in education of, uh, becoming an instructor and a tactical <laughs> expert. Um, and, and at the weapon school, we, you know, we have all kinds of different aircraft platforms, um, Intel, cyberspace, every, every uh, munition, 
everything. That's a big thing about weapon about weapon school is, you know, even me that spent 15 years as a TAC-P, there's a number of munitions that I never got to call uh, call in or see live, but you guys at yep. weapon school get to train on pretty much everything. Got, get to do that, get to plan for it. Cause a lot of it is, you know, when you have an enormous stack and by stack means, uh, you know, for the listeners is a bunch of aircraft stacked at different altitudes, almost like a upside down wedding cake. And then all talking to you in, in yeah. different ears. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and also getting yelled at by the ground force commander you know, or maybe getting shot or shot at or something like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's knowing, being able to identify the target, understand the, the makeup of the target, and then picking the right ordinance with the right airframe on the right time and all that integration. And then you can integrate artillery and all that kind of Essentially you're a JTAC doctor now. Well, I, I was, yeah. I, but maybe not now. I'm a little out of practice now, probably. But <laughs> as you graduate weapons school, you become a yes. JTAC doctor. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, and everybody refers to you as such. So, what year did you enlist? What did you come in as? How did this? How did how did combat control take you uh, and steal you away from the regular Air Force? And what was that? <laughs> what was that process like for you? Well, I was 17 when I came in. I came in in 99. So, and I came in to be a PJ because I didn't know what combat control was. All, <laughs> all the recruiter knew was PJ. And, you know, the pamphlet got me. I'm guaranteed dive school, guaranteed free fall, guaranteed airborne, go to survival, get the shoot, jump out of plane, do all that. So, Sounds like, perfect. sign me up. So, I, I went <laughs> in, you know, and, um, and I'll tell you what, man, I'm sure you felt the same way when you get there. Uh, Cause I'm not sure. How old were you when you came in? 17. 17. I turned okay, 18, yeah. uh, my fourth week of basic training. Yeah. So I know for me anyway, cause I'm, you know, your listeners don't know, but I'm a smaller dude. So I'm, I, I'm at the pool, you know, that was one of the first times we're there and I'm in front of the entire class, not in front of them, but we're all together. And you see these enormous dudes that are all older, a little more mature or, you know, that are, I'm like standing next to them. How am I going to compete with these guys? Like, but as we're going along, those guys start quitting and, and failing. And it's like, well, I'm, okay, I'm still here. So <laughs> I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and, and go for that. But so while I was at, in at the time that selection was called the indoc or indoctrination course. So, um, and there was a lot more tradition back then, like, you know, with the ASCOT and everything oh, like, yeah. like, like back then on Lackalin, you can tell, right. If you made it through hell week of indoc, you, yep. you wore the ASCOT yeah. and it was, you guys walked around, walked around Lackland and, and everybody knew like, Oh, 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 that guy's going to be a PJ. That's a, <laughs> that's a really good memory. A lot of people have forgotten about the, uh, the ASCOT. It was, uh, well, it was, it was the feet, like, like, it just seems like, I mean, I still remember that. I remember every time we, we would run over the feet, you yeah. would, uh, guys would yell, who ya green feet. Yep. And then slap and, the door, never quit yeah. on the way out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, a big thing. And I, I think it just, you know, it instills it in you, but, um, so I'm there at NDOC and I'm, I'm there with a bunch of PJ trainees, but also combat control trainees. And I have no idea what they are. And then we finally, we got a brief on what a combat controller actually does. He showed us some radios. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And they offered us the opportunity to change our contract on the spot. Um, I was like, me and a couple other guys were like, yeah, we'll, we'll swap. And then Do it. <laughs> and then the rest is history with the pipeline. <laughs> yeah, I went, I went to the SEER briefing first and then walked out of the SEER briefing and, and walked into the TACP briefing. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. But I do remember my recruiter, because I was really, I was really uh, like, I was kind of sad I was going into the Air Force because I wanted to like really fight. Like I was mm -hmm. all, you know, full of piss and vinegar and ready to go. At 17, and I remember, yeah. <laughs> I remember my recruiter popping in a VHS that was like a four minute video about combat mm -hmm. control, but it was just so poorly done that even when it was done, I didn't understand what this job was. And I also too, I remember I'm a 17 year old kid and it just combat controller. Like it, 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 
I didn't understand what it meant. I was like, I don't get it. Like I, all, all I, I just remember watching a guy be interviewed in camo paint and it's yeah, like, yeah. but I still think it's funny that my recruiter popped in a VHS and sat me down to watch this video. <laughs> you mean he, he rolled out? I can, I can see it exactly right now back in school where they had the tube TV with the ratchet strap going down and they pull it out on the tray. <laughs> <laughs> so how was CCS for you? You get to, you get to Fort Bragg. Well, you go to, uh, cause, cause a lot of these guys, you know, don't, don't know what the combat control pipeline entailed. So you, do you leave in doc at that point and go straight into, uh, combat control selection or how did it work for you? No, mo- most of us go to air traffic control school, which at the time was at Kiesler and that's, I'm going to say it was a 12 or 16 week course. And then the, the airborne survival, um, scuba school and stuff like that were all, kind of depending on the schedule. So sometimes you'd be back at Lackland for a couple of weeks and then you go to a school or, but generally they tried to do graduate in doc, go to scuba school because we were in such great shape from swimming from shape. Yeah. From in doc, yeah. To, that we could go crush dive school down at Key West and then go to air traffic control school. And then our last school was combat control school. Now that pipeline has changed uh, quite a bit since 99 and 2000 when I went through, but um, now it's, it's a assessment and selection for a couple of weeks at the beginning. Um, if you're fortunate enough, you get the eight week special warfare prep prior to yeah. that. So you got the eight weeks prep, the couple weeks of uh, assessment and selection, and then you kick off your pipeline of, you know, all the ATC survival, you know, medical. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so for those of you out there that are unfamiliar with JTAC, combat control, TACP, all that. So you have, you have two, two career fields, the TACP career field, which was the one I was in, and then combat control, which combat control pri- primarily and, and all the time support, SOCOM. And they have two primary mission sets. You have your airfield or uh, how are airfields, mm-hmm. like setting up and creating an airfield like an austere uh, ATC command. So, so the people that sit in the tower and land airplanes and stuff like that, um, you know, these guys are originally designed to go in and jump in generally with the Rangers or people that are going to seize an airfield, then they're going to set the airfield up and start landing all the army guys down on the ground to get everybody in, in and start, start the whole logistic supply chain and things like that. But, you know, you guys also have the JTAC mission, which took a primary seat, obviously, in oh, the yeah. GWAT. So what year did you graduate combat control school? And was there AST then, or had that not been created? I graduated in 2001, the spring of 2001, and AST, I was the first class to go through AST. Or and that's advanced, called advanced skill advanced training. Advanced skills training. Yeah. It's and we'll, it's just we'll follow these, on. We'll get these yeah. acronyms. Not we're, we're trying to keep you with us. I promise. <laughs> I I heard all your comments after after the after the grand episode. So I'm I'm trying to be cognizant of it. So <laughs> you go to advanced skills training. 9/11 obviously happened while you were in yeah. the pipeline. Uh, so where did what was your first duty station? Uh, Pope Air Force Base. Actually, you were at yeah. the 21st. Yeah, I was at the okay. Long. So then, uh, you know, I drove past you every morning as I was on my way to my squadron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what years were you there at Pope? I showed up at Pope in 2003. Okay. Yeah. I left in September of 03 to go over to Milton Hall. Nice. Oh, nice. Dude, I spent eight years over there and it was fantastic. Gotta hey, love you Europe. Can't complain, can't complain about being in Britain, I guess, no. <laughs> unless you <laughs> unless you're you don't like the rain. Yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> So when was your first deployment? Uh, 2002. So, I mean, I, I went 2002, 2003, 2004, um, and then so on sporadic. It got a little bit more sporadic, but you know how, how it was those first couple of years was, I mean, yeah, what was that? What was that first one like for you? Were you JTAC qualified? No, I was not. I was doing CSAR though. Um, so I was pulling, and that's a really rad mission, (laughs) combat search and rescue. So were you, uh, were you attached to just a, uh, JPRC uh, or SOCOM or were you attached to a, a, a PJ unit? So we were, 
The STS, we were at, at that time, the 2-1 STS didn't have PJs. So we took PJs from a different unit and mixed us together. So it was two PJs and myself. And we were flying on the 53s, on the MH-53s, which were That's really amazing. cool. Yeah, amazing that is super group. cool. I miss them so much. <laughs> but uh, we were, you know, we were in Kandahar and we were supporting the Rangers and anybody else who was, who was doing stuff. So, and then I got a chance to come off a of CSAR and attach with the Kiwi SAS guys, which was oh, that is super cool. And not a JTAC. Like it was, it was just like, Hey, why don't you go on out there? You've done a good job and hang out. <laughs> and it was, I, mean, a- I learned so much from those guys. <laughs> Yeah, I got to work with a bunch of them uh, my last year in. They came out on a joint exercise, and they were they were awesome dudes. Yeah. It was just a, a super fun experience and a cool bunch of guys. Um, so you go to the UK, and again, you're deploying pretty much every year at that point. You finally get your JTAC. Did you go through Nellis, or did you go yep. through Europe? Yeah, I went through Nellis, okay. yeah. Back in, uh, I want to say it was, I got my... I think I went through in 2003 and I think I got my rating in 2004, if I remember right. But nice. um, Yeah. And then I've been doing JTAC stuff ever since. What was that first JTAC deployment like for you? My, my first JTAC deployment was 2004 and it was, I was with a good group of guys, but we just didn't, we didn't get in the merit very much at all. The next one though, that was tell us about tell us about it. Come on, let's go. Oh, it, was, it was this war story time. Is that what it is? Yeah, heck yeah, they love it. We we love this. I enjoy hearing it because you know you were there in 05 where you in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh I was o- o- 02 Afghanistan, o- 03 Iraq, o- 04 Afghanistan. I'm actually more Afghanistan throughout my entire yeah. entire time, but yeah, 2006 was a was a good one because it was a nice six month deployment where I was attached to the Canadian SAS guys. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't remember if they're called SAS or not, but they're they're the Cansoft Command- guys. Commandos or Cansoft, yeah. something like that. Those dudes were again amazing, and um, and they really took me in, treated me as one of their own, and it was it was great. But we'd go out there and we'd we'd get some. And then about halfway through, they went out on rest and recovery, and I then got attached to an ODA at the same uh, FOB or forward operating base, which also were a bunch of pipe hitters and wanted to go out and get some. So I got to continue with them and dropped a lot of ordnance. I, I ended up Winchestering, or for people who don't know, Winchestering means emptying out all the munitions out of a plane. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to Winchester a couple of AC 130s, which oh is a lot. That is pounds. that that is probably the best achievement that you can ever get <laughs> as a JTAC is to Winchester an AC 130. So uh, that's pretty badass. That's like prestige mode in uh, <laughs> Call of Duty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it, it was just during that. You know, it was a. About a two week time frame where it was just hot and heavy, and it was A10 after A10, and then Harriers and AC130 B1s, MQ1s, and it was just a constant. And that was so I don't know if you remember or not 2006 A10 fratricide, uh, Marines, uh, the conventional Canadian, uh, Army. okay. So okay. They, yeah. What happened? And it was it was bad. So this was during that two week period where things were just. I mean, it was the wild west. Me and the Kansoff guys were up on top of the mountain. The Canadian strikers and and their conventional force were down at the base of the mountain. And we had been we had been wrecking shop all night. And I was tired, and we were coming down. We were able to come down the mountain, and there still needed to be targets prosecuted. So I handed the control of the aircraft and targeting and stuff like that over to the conventional Canadian JTAC that was on the ground. And as we're about halfway down the mountain, it just got this weird spidey senses popped up. This was, this was a, a F-15 strike Eagle, wasn't it? No, that- it was A-10. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, dude, I, I just happened to like, God, what is weird? And I look back and I can see an A-10, which, looks like it's pointed at us, 
but the geometry of it was actually a little bit ahead of us and a plume of smoke just coming out the back. And I was like, well, that's it done. But the rounds go past us and hit the guys. I think it was 34 injured. Um, I think one or two dead. It was there's a helmet. Bad. There's a helmet cam footage of this. Isn't there? If there is, I haven't seen it, but I'd love to see it. Okay. Yeah. I, I have to, I remember, I remember that might've been Brits though. I, I, there is a, there is a, uh, an A-10 strafe that, that is right on top of them. And I don't know if, if that was this or not. And you know what? I, I don't really remember that because I, I remember in 06, there was a, there was a strike Eagle Eagle incident. Um, I just don't remember who it involved, uh, as far as the guys on the ground, I know it was, it was a strafing incident, but so again, for those of you out there, like the worst thing that you can do as a JTAC, your whole job for being there is to make sure that friendlies aren't getting shot with our own aircraft. And when you mess up as a JTAC, uh, it gets logged in something that all of your friends have to read once a month and it doesn't omit your name. No. So when, and, and, and that goes for both like real world and in training fuck up. So even if you're in training and you notionally, you know, without real munitions, if you fuck up and action accidentally bomb good guys or yourself, that entire incident is put into this file that every JTAC in the entire DOD has to read once a month and sign off that they read it. So honestly, I am a hundred percent for this because it really was an amazing training tool. And uh, there wasn't that many entries. And I think it's because when like, like I remember Specifically, there was an entry put in 2006 from a, a, a notional B-52 situation out at JRTC, but I remember knowing, knowing the name on there and just like being so terrified of having never want to be in this yeah. book. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the thing is like what we would do as, as instructors is we would take some of these scenarios that were written into this, this read file, or, you know, when you hear about some of these guys that come back with silver stars and these um, amazing situations that they were in, we take those, build a, a scenario to then put students through it and recreate it. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. there's so much learning that you can't duplicate in a classroom or on a PowerPoint or anything like that. you have got to experience it. You know, that was kind of a complaint I had. And I was talking to a couple of the guys uh, last week, one of your friends, Tim Pachesa, a, a guy, <laughs> some, of, some of you might know, a few others, Party Ben. Oh. But it was like reflecting back on my career, I remember, I remember how many times we're shown what not to do. But what we what what never happened in my entire career none of our weapon our weapons and tactics guys or our jtac guys none of them ever pulled us in and said hey listen to this because this is what right sounds like and i'm kind of like man that would have been really helpful if <laughs> rather than every time we're sitting in that in the skiff or the vault or whatever and and they're like listen to this it's this is all fucked up it's show, like okay show me right sh Show me someone that just, you know, executed the most puppet master th uh, cast call ever yeah. with a multi aircraft everywhere. I would have loved that. Like, okay, that's what right sounds like. Okay. And then how many things are you going to be able to take away from a guy when you're listening to him just execute perfectly? So it's just yeah. one of those things. And that, that's, that's actually what a lot of us would do. Um, as instructors, not only at the squadron, but at the weapon school, before each uh, ride or each phase, there would be a demo where one of the instructors had to be put into a student role to then demonstrate what a proper execution is and then be able to debrief where they messed up and where they excelled. Yeah, and that's a big thing that um, that you guys at the weapon stool, school kind of standardized across the board in the JTAC world was the debrief. And really, you know, when you start looking back on 
on, you know, for me specifically, it's like, that was one of those things that was overlooked. It was like, oh, you did kind of good or hey, you suck tonight. Like, whereas what you guys developed when you went and, and started weapon school, you developed a standard that helps you yeah. be better the next time you go out. And that, that, that definitely was overdue. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it helps you not only identify where you went wrong or where, where other things went wrong, but then learn from them and be able to, you know, learn from it and change it on next one. Unlike what you said, when you come off the mountain, all right, that was uh man, you didn't do very well. Or there was a whole lot of yelling and uh, yeah. Not, yeah, a lot of yelling, not much instruction. <laughs> see you know exactly what i'm talking about <laughs> oh you know i'm having i'm having the flashbacks but uh so yeah you you come out of when you came out of weapon school and you had your patch after being an instructor and essentially creating the course for everybody else where'd you go from there uh i went to the 23rd sts down at herbert field oh my old girl yeah. well, my old neighbor yeah, yeah. So I used, <laughs> I used to be down there teaching the schoolhouse and all my, my old friends were, were over at the 23rd. There's a lot of great people over there. At the, oh yeah. All, that was... all over Herbie. Herbie is just a breeding ground for, <laughs> for studs. It really is. No, I love, I loved that area. It was super fun. And, and, uh, was talking to, to one of our, our joint friends, Stefan Jorgensen today, you know, he's, <laughs> He's running, he's running that show down there now. Jory. So now on to one's ready again. You're now, now your focus is shaping all these new kids coming in uh, to, to try for one of these four. Yep, that's right. And, and it's actually not just limited to, to those. We will hit seer specialist, we'll hit EOD. Um, obviously we hit TAC P so it's, it's good. We, we try and get all six of the career fields, combat controller, special reconnaissance, PJ, TAC P, EOD and seer specialist. So we try and give information. And then if you actually count the officer, you know, you got your TAC P officers, you got your special tactics Stills. officers and your combat rescue officers. So we try and get a bunch of people on there and give information out on that. And then we had some guard TAC P's on there. Uh, two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. No, that's good because the guard process is, is a lot different. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I, I kind of like the guard process a little bit better uh, because the units and, and, and if you're ever interested to go TAC P, I would always suggest guard first because you, you show up at the unit you want to go to, you attend uh, a drill weekend and everybody interacts with you and, 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 and they take you on whatever exercise or whatever they're doing. And then if they decide that you're, you know, they want to put the time into bringing you into the family, you'll go through a, uh, tap, what they call taps, which is a five day assessment and, and selection that, uh, the guard just, the TACP units created for themselves, unit specific. So it differs whether you're in Washington or yep. Idaho or things like that. And when you finish taps without quitting, then that unit will get you squared away with your training date and going to the schoolhouse or, well, you still have to complete the actual selection. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but again, you're going to be much more prepared because you've already been through one with guys. You've been around tack peas at that point and they're pushing to get you at that unit. So I just, I, I like the guard set up a little bit better. Um, it's a when little I bit more. It's a little bit more selective too, because I mean, you got to go interview, and if yes. if they don't think you'll pass or they don't really like you, I mean, you're just not going to get hired because they're not going to waste that spot. On my last your, three years, you know. yeah, my last three years, and it was was in the guard, and that was exactly it. We would have young kids come out that had completed basic training, and they would spend a weekend with us and then we would kick them out before the last day of drill. And then on the last day of the drill, the commander would come up and we had a slideshow. Hey, what do you guys think about this guy? Yeah or nay? Nay. Okay. Next. This guy. Yeah or nay? Yay. All right. Let's get this guy going. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, it was more a, selective. It was a cool process. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm not being fair. It's not. It's not necessarily that it's more selective. It's just that it's a more deliberate process. Well, um, you're getting pre you're getting pre selected by your unit, and right. you're also you're getting pre selected from a unit that's going to be with you forever. Because mm -hmm. in the guard, you're not changing units. You know, it's not like being active duty where every four years, you know, you're up for orders and you're going to a different unit. So these guys, but with that, for me, my experience was, was extremely wet, was extremely good because I walked into a place where everybody liked each other. And that was a weird feeling having been <laughs> active duty for 13 years, transitioning to the guard and now I'm at this unit and everybody's enjoying being there and everybody's excited and everybody works together and everybody yeah. likes each other. I'm like, what? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I've met many people that haven't enjoyed the guard. And it's not that all active duty people dislike each other. It's just, it's a very competitive and dog eat dog on the teams and at special tactics squadrons and at, um, you know, a sauces and stuff. So, okay. So if you're a listener out there and you're in the army, the Marines, the Navy, even the air force, and you are looking for a career change, I would recommend both of these career fields a hundred times over. I had so much fun as a TACP and the experiences that you're going to get like to me. And this is how I felt is I truly got to experience the military for everything that it does at a whole. Oh, you yeah. know, I got, I got to be on an aircraft carrier while it was out to sea. I got to, I got to drive a tank. I got to fly in a helicopter. I got to parachute out of airplanes. Yeah. Like, like, so it's like, for me, I'm like, no, I did, I did everything you could do in the military pretty much. <laughs> that, and that's what's great about it. That's what's great about our two jobs is that, you, you get to attach to different units and you're not stuck with one unit and you'll, you'll work with a great one. Then you'll work with a not great, so great one, but you'll get to experience a lot more than a lot of the other uh, career fields, you know? And uh, yeah, like just, just run down kind of uh, what it is day to day for a combat controller, you know, give, tell them what it's like when you're, when, when you make it through all this training, I know we keep talking about like, this is going to be hard. You're going to go through 90, 90 schools and you, you know, but once you're there, what, what can they expect? So once you get on team, uh, you're going to be with about 24 other dudes on your team. And then, you know, if you're back at home station training, you could be doing anything but by shooting, driving dirt bikes, jumping, diving, talking on radios, talking to aircraft on radios, um, doing demolition, it, a whole bunch of different stuff. And that's just home station. And I mean, it could change every single week. It could change every day even. Um, and then, you know, if you do need to go on a training trip to a school, maybe you maybe you're stationed at Herbert Field and there's no mountains and you need some mountains training. So now you go out to Boise, Idaho or or Denver or something like that. And you go skiing and, and cross country skiing. It's not necessarily downhill, but Oops, the snowshoe shit like, uh, that destroyed me. I hated it. But, uh, <laughs> so the key, the key takeaway here though, is, and this is always something that I've told people, uh, about the beauty of our jobs is when we're home and not deployed, our job is to train, to yep. deploy, so we don't have to have aircraft taking off and landing. We don't have to make sure an aircraft is fixed. We don't have to work on patients like the medical field does. So there's no requirement from the Air Force that's that's breathing down our neck saying, hey, this has to happen this many times a day. Otherwise, your unit is failing. No, it's you have to be ready to go to war. And it gives you – you have so much more freedom – Oh yeah. To build your, your training, your training schedule. And once you make a little bit of rank and you get the freedom to start building that training schedule, the possibilities are endless with these two jobs. If you want to go call Naval gunfire, you know, all you got to do is pick up the phone and start tracking down who a, a, a destroyer to, and a, and a, and a, and a range that you could you can organize a trip to do naval gunfire. You that's know, been, that's been one of the most amazing things is getting to network and meet 
all the people that we get to. I, I mean, it's incredible because there are some amazing people out there that are outside of special warfare, outside of the soft community that, I mean, they still have the same motivation and drive to make the mission happen and get stuff done no matter what, no, you know, no questions asked. And those are the kind of people that I like to be around. It's like, Hey, yeah, we'll do the right thing. But if, if some corners need to be cut or as long as we are, we may not be doing the correct thing, but as long as we're doing the right thing, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what, what are some of your, your favorite moments of being a, a combat controller? Because again, like, to get through that two-year pipeline and then finally getting the payoff, what were those moments that you were like, this is rad? Uh, <laughs> uh, the firefights, really. Yeah. <laughs> they were, I mean, for, they were fun. I mean, they were, you yeah. know, it's, you get, you get to see the, the, and it's not, and I don't mean that as, as a warmonger or anything like that, but, some funny no, thing. You mean but, it. You you yeah. mean it as it's like we we go into the battlefield just as you would if your older brother was hanging out right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so you get you get a chance to go validate yourself, right? Because that, I mean, we go through all this training. It's like, man, I hope I actually get to use it one day, and I hope I perform well. So you get that validation. You get to see the kind of human spirit do remarkable things by you know in some really really bad situations. And then on the other part of it, you know, there's always some funny stuff that happens. Somebody's running in a firefight, you know, trying not to get shot, running from building to building, and they trip and bust their ass or something. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> so there's usually something funny that happens during it as well. But, uh, <laughs> any good, uh, any, any dive scares, because that's, that's, that's the hokey stuff to me is that dive stuff. You know, I, do you have any? I haven't. I mean, I, I dove one time and it was, there was a storm, lightning storm. It wasn't striking. So it was just, but it was bright enough to, to light up the ocean. And I saw a shark. And of, of course, you know, in the water, things just seem bigger. So <laughs> I, I'm sitting here going like, oh my God, that thing's enormous. And then, you know, lightning flash, I see it. And then it's pitch black, and I'm like, "Oh man, this sucks." And I'm with six <laughs> other guys. Nav board, yeah. like, uh. <laughs> like this is terrible. Well, that was the thing is, I wasn't naving. Somebody else was naving. So all I'm doing is I'm on a buddy line, you know, because we're all attached, all six of us, and it's just kind of swimming. Like, oh man, here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's really the only diving thing that that I had a jump scare where I, Ooh. yeah. Um, where we were jumping out at three thirty five hundred 3,500 or 3,000 feet over water. Okay. Um, Cause it, over water, we're allowed to go down lower and jump out and pull my chute, my main, and it wraps around my fins that I'm wearing. Cause we're jumping into the North sea. So I'm spinning. It's wrapped around my leg. I try and clear it, but I can't. So I'm like, well, I'm falling way too fast. So I pull my oh, this reserve. This is a disaster. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I pull my reserve. It also wraps around my leg. So I've got both shoots that are about each one's about 25% inflated and they're spinning and they're hitting each other. And every time they hit each other, they collapse. So I, I go like, I'm slow. Then I drop, then I slow, then I drop. I grab my knife out and I'm trying to cut it away, but every time I reach up to cut it, because I would change the dynamic of the, the suspension would, on the cords, it would collapse <laughs> even more. And I'm like, all right. And so I, I see the water approaching fast and I'm head, I'm heads down, you know, because it's wrapped around my legs. I take yeah. my knife. I'm like, well, I definitely don't want to stab myself. So I chuck the knife and then I, I smash into the water and I'm kind of like, check Oh, okay. And then I pop out of the water. I'm like, oh, I'm good. <laughs> dude, <laughs> what are I, the other guys that jumped with you thinking? Oh, dude, they were spiraling down to try and try and find me Ooh. or not find me, but keep up with Just, me. But then the boat, well, there the you boat go. comes screaming up and, it, you know, and there's a PJ on there who's a, a safety diver or standby diver. And he's, he's like, he sees me come up and I'm just, Woo! and he, he's like, you okay? Well, I'm like, yeah, well, get in here and help me get out of my parachute. Yeah, because I'm getting, you know, I, I'm still a little <laughs> bit like. <laughs> oh, nobody has this on film. No, but I've got a still picture. I'll have to send it to you. 
Oh, oh man, man. The that is <laughs> that is wild, man. Double malfunction. Thank God you were going into water. Exactly, because if I wasn't, <laughs> I would have hit head first into whatever ground there was. Oh man, what kind of helmet do you have on? I think it was just a water protect helmet. So it oh, wasn't any, it wasn't anything that would have gonna save me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm going through it when you're telling me, oh reserve just wrapped around my feet. It's like, oh okay, where's what's the play here? <laughs> and that's and that's the thing. I was out. I was like, okay, well, both of my shoots are out, they're both tangled up. I can't reach it to cut it off. Uh well, I'm stuck. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to give this one a sh- yep. shot, gents. All right. Uh, in. <laughs> you know, when we were down at uh, Fort Bragg recently where, uh, for Matt's book, we met this uh, uh, Sergeant Major of the 82nd came out and he introduced us to this kid that had a 100% malfunction, like jumped out, static line just ripped in half or just when it, when it came out a shoot, that was it. It was just a static line. There was nothing attached and he pulled his reserve. Nothing happened. And he oh. rode all the way in and he got up and had a broken left ankle and everybody's looking at him like, and they have the video, which the Sergeant major showed me, but he said that he's the only one that has it. Yeah, they yeah. will not get. They will not give it to him. But they have the the NVG footage where you see the plane and you see that dot just come out and go straight to the ground. Dude, that's heinous. But and I can't believe he only got had a broken ankle. How is that yeah, possible? I, I followed him on Instagram and he jumped again like two months ago. Like now, see that's that's awesome because. He got, he was able to get right back on the horse. I mean, you know, relatively soon after, after doing it, man, it was, it was probably six months till I was able to jump again. <laughs> not really? because, not because of, you know, being scared or anything like that, just because of jump opportunity. We didn't have that many yeah. jump opportunities in England because of the weather, you know, <laughs> did you just start clipping your fins? Like, oh, I'll wait for these. <laughs> Dude, I couldn't reach it, man. Couldn't reach anything. <laughs> <laughs> Did you jump with fins again after that? Actually, I don't think I have. <laughs> I don't think I have. <laughs> that's that's wild. Oh man, what about what's your favorite cast story? Um. Oh man, it could I, be training or combat because there's there's some. Well, yeah, I mean, so the I would say the weapon school. If I'm gonna, you know, dive in on on training and say that training ones are some of the best because the, you take, like you mentioned, you it's the top gun for the Air Force. So you take incredible pilots that can do incredible things with an aircraft that most people can't do or even think of, and, and go out there and lay waste to targets. Um, I, I mean, a specific story, I don't know, because there's a whole bunch. Now, I do – so a kind of cool story is um, – so that 2006, right, it, it was big firefights, stuff like that. Well, now, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I'm at the weapons school, and I'm at a house party, just a little get-together. You know, we had gotten some new instructors in, A-10 instructors and, and JTAC instructors. So we're just kind of introducing ourselves and, you know, getting to know each other, and and I'm at the the – chip and dip bowl with another a 10 pilot. And we're just kind of like, Oh, where are you? You know, deployed, you know, figuring each other out. And we were both deployed in 2006. And then he starts saying like, yeah, you know, I supported this guy and there was a football shaped mountain and they got out of the strikers and it was just a barrage of gunfire and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, what month was that? What operation was that? <laughs> oh yeah, that was me. He's like, no, you were the, you were the dude that had everything, you know, from the mountain and North. Like, yeah, yeah, that was me. He's like, I never thought I'd actually get a chance to meet you. And we've been great friends ever since. That's so cool. And that that happens all the time. Like I've had it so many times with helicopter pilots and stuff like that. They start explaining some detail. I'm like, Wait a Sounds minute. Familiar. <laughs> Hang <laughs> on a second. Uh, I was actually lucky because in 2007, 
a couple of the the more heated situations that I was in, like I ended up flying back to Balad to debrief uh, with them. So I actually got to meet oh, uh, awesome. a couple groups. Um, most of them were buzzards, the five tenth out of out of it- Italy, and I'm still yeah. still really good friends uh, with some of those guys to this day because uh, we had. A, I mean, it was a, it was a wild time, and it was you stay you stay friends, especially getting to go to go back and sit down with them when it's still fresh and you can go, Oh, okay. What happened here? What happened here? Why did this get, why did this get fucked up? And it's like, that does so much for you, especially if you, okay. So you got the debrief, you get all those learning points and stuff like that, but getting to put a face to the voice and the call sign, when you get in another troops in contact or another sicky situation, and those guys are checking on and you they feel know that much better. Oh, it's incredible. And they will, yeah. they will work harder for you. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, at, at, that, at that point, I'm just a voice, you know, before that I'm a voice on a radio that's in trouble. And most, most people are, you know, pilots are putting out to support us, but then when they know you, it's, oh, yeah. it's a like you feel invincible level. on the ground. Yeah. Like, like I'm going to make it out. That's- when, when, when they would check on, and it was one of the guys I knew. I'd be like, "I'm safe. This yeah. guy's. This guy is gonna is gonna nail it for me." <laughs> there's there's just this inherent trust that you can't. It's not tangible. You can't. You know. You can't see it. Can't prove it. But there's just some trust there that is amazing. <laughs> well, so we're uh, anybody that might be interested out there. Branch transfers. You know. Uh, you know, if you're a Marine, Coast Guard. Navy, Army, whatever, or you're in the Air Force currently and you're looking to get into an Air Force special warfare job, um, you know, where can they find the ones ready stuff? Where can they listen to the podcast? Where can they contact you guys if they have specific questions about the career fields? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we're at onesready.com. We're on Instagram as well, at onesready. I am at CCT Peaches. Um, they can... DM us on there, or they can hit and us it's up. And it's O-N-E-S, ready. One's ready. ready. Yep. Got it. And then we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Buzzsprout, Stitcher, YouTube. We're on all the, the main main things that you get awesome. your well, podcast enjoyment from. I hope, uh, I hope you guys can help some of our listeners that might want to look at this as a possible career change. I mean, I'm always going to recommend it yeah, because yeah. it is. <laughs> It is really fun. <laughs> well, I mean, look at how well you've done. I mean, look at all the, I mean, seriously, look at all the amazing people that you've gotten to meet and yes. how, how much of that is because being a tech fee. Almost all of it. Ex- like, exactly. Yes. The, the people like, that I have met, because it, it's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know. I mean, yes. And it's just incredible people great Americans, great international people. That Getting just- to inter- intermingle with the, the fighter pilot community and the attack pilot community was, I mean, that's cool to me too, because it's like, that's what the air force is. And we get to be someone that's part of that chain. Yeah. And that, that was that I, I always felt a lot of pride with that. And it was just, it was, it was a lot of fun also too. It was, the guys that raised me when I was young were are are legendary names now, um, and they were they were incredibly hard on me. But when I was by myself as the one Air Force guy with an entire battalion of Army guys, I wasn't phased. I wasn't. Yeah, it didn't affect my personality. It didn't affect my decision making process. It didn't affect me speaking up if I needed to speak up, no matter who was in the room about about a situation. Like, like it, if I felt I had a, a a good way to handle it with air power, I would I would say it, and I owe that to the people that that brought me up in the 14th yep. ASOS because they were they were fucking wolves. Yep. No, <laughs> I mean really we. There are some legends out there in the TACP combat control community that have just done some amazing things. And even, even some, I mean, some of them are younger guys that, yeah. it, that are just done some incredible things. But also there's, there's older guys that stories that, that you've never heard. So it's yep. like, yeah, you know, there's movies that have been made out there about, you know, um, you've got, 
Chris Kyle's movie, American Sniper, you've got Lone Survivor, but I am, I am definitely trying to start pulling more of our, of our cross and silver star recipients to tell their stories. Because when you start hearing some of these situations, you're going to go, what? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Unreal. What? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unreal. And the thing is that we're, you know, the soft community is typically quiet professionals. Like they pride themselves on it, which is great because it teaches a certain amount of humility, but at the same time, we're, we're not, we can do a better job of messaging and recruitment which is kind of why we have started the ones ready thing, because it's just, we need to message better. The biggest help that any young person can get when it comes to trying to go for one of these things is to give them somebody to strive to be. Yeah. You have to give them examples. And, you know, this was a conversation that I had when I was in the Air Force about, you know, there was a long gap where we weren't decorating anybody. It wasn't a shortage of people doing great things. It was just everybody was barred down from deployments. Nobody was submitting decks. Nobody was doing the right, you know, hey, we should probably recognize this guy. And when I brought up that point, you know, I was met with, we don't do this stuff for awards. And that's when I reminded him, I go, no, we don't do it for awards. But recognizing the guys that did great things gives all these kids in here that are about to go get their JTAC cert somebody to be. Yep. And that is necessary. I had that as a young guy because the wars had just kicked off and that first round of decks came out and you had your first like seven TAC piece over star recipients. You had Sather who was, who was killed in action and a, and a fob was named after him. It was a combat controller. So you had, you had all these stories that you could, that I had, you know, as a young guy could, could read and then know, okay, that's what I want to be someday. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. You know, I want to make sure that I, that I get out of a situation the same he did. Um, and you're so right. It's, I, it's not, it's not about the decorations itself or the medals. Uh -huh. It's, it's about, you know, you got Chapman that got the medal of honor. You got Sean Harvell, two silver stars, Ish Viegas, two silver stars. Like, I mean, you got guys that, you wouldn't know their story without these award write-ups and they don't, yes. I mean, they could care less about they're, that. They're not going to tell you. No, 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 <laughs> they're not, you know, but in order to get their story out there and recognize the community and recognize them and their achievements and their actions, it has to be written up. Yeah. Well, Peaches, I thank you for coming on. Um, I'm excited to see what you do next uh, because I really like what you guys are doing and it, it's been necessary for a long time. And I think you guys are going to, you're going to see, you know, a couple years from now, you guys are going to see your success. Like, cause you're going to have a bunch of people wearing berets that, oh, that, that give a lot of credit to you guys. So I'm super, super happy and proud to, to be connected with you guys. And I'm glad to have you on the show. Well, I appreciate you having me, man. And congratulations on everything you guys have done. It's been pretty awesome to see see you grow um, well before me, but uh, it's pretty awesome to see where you guys are at now, you and the entire uh, crew, you know? Thank you. Thank you. So if you are interested in one of these things, look up One's Ready, O-N-E-S, ready.com, One's Ready on Instagram, or send Peaches a message, uh, send him a meme, yeah. send him something, <laughs> CCT Peaches, on Instagram. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Free Ranger 